see and you see by the dawn's early light oh, so proudly we hailed at the twilight that's gleaming whose broad stripes and bright through the perilous fight Oh, the ramparts we walked Were so gallantly streaming And the road Welcome to another episode on this week's 172nd Air Wing video. So before we get into the fun parts of today's discussion, we'll cover some housekeeping items related to the channel. I'll first extend my sincere thanks to my subscribers and those of you who support the channel and the content that I've been creating. Um, I took a month off through June to take care of some life stuff and some projects. I also took a month off to look at the channel and see where I could realize some improvements. As a, a certain poet once said, true nobility is not comparing yourself to someone else and decreeing yourself better. It is comparing your current self to your previous self and knowing you are better. And in that spirit, I have endeavored to improve the quality of my videos throughout the life of the channel. And therein, I realized I had a problem because circa May, I was trying to keep to my every week Sunday schedule and realized that the more creative and more effective my video production was, the more time it took to produce them. And at the end of May, the last F4 comparison video I uploaded uh, took about five hours of preparation, video editing, and shooting, and so forth to prepare uh, in order to get about uh, 30 to 40 minutes of footage. And I love doing this. I love sharing the passion of aviation and airplane models with the community here. And I would certainly love to be in the logistical position to just do this full time and not have to worry about such pedestrian concerns like paying for my food or the roof over my head or the fuel in my car. Unfortunately, I have to worry about those things too. And when I look at the amount of time I have each week to put to a video, um, the month of May fairly clearly illustrated to me that I had hit that limit. Uh, five hours each week of video production time um, longer sometimes if there is an issue or an error with any of the technical steps, which has happened. Um, it, that basically put me in a position where cranking out new videos every week was just untenable. Um, I want to produce better content as I go, and you all deserve uh, the best content that I can create. And I can't do that if I'm hamstrung by the amount of time each week I can produce something. And further, some of the projects that I have planned, like some of the model modification videos that I've got uh, planned and jotted down to produce for you all, uh, those projects take time too. 
and some of these reviews as well like this sr71 review i had to read probably about a good five or six hours worth of uh, printed source material and content to condense it to something that would be worthwhile for you the audience to see and when all this time is rolled up um, basically it means that i'm not in a position to both improve my videos and maintain my every Sunday at six o'clock in the morning release schedule. So something has to give and it's not going to be quality, not if I can help it. So I'm going to be uploading on a bit of a slower basis, um, but my aim is even though I won't be producing as many videos, um, hopefully I won't get thwacked too badly by the YouTube social media algorithm. And for better on that, I'll be able to produce videos that you will all enjoy seeing and enjoy seeing repetitively. And I'll furthermore be able to enjoy making these instead of feeling rushed and freaking out whenever some technical snag delays production or something of that sort. So um, hopefully we will all be better off moving forward. And uh, if and when in the future I can get some higher grade video editing software and um, computer hardware, Maybe I can change the dynamic and upload a bit more often. We'll see how things go. So with the housekeeping out the way, we will get to the uh, piece de resistance, which is the SR71 Blackbird. This one is in 172nd scale, of course, and is produced by Century Wings. This one is of the uh, Rapid Rabbit name. It's one of the only, uh, one of the four SR-71s that were ever received a nickname, and Rapid Rabbit, well, I'll explain that later if it's not obvious, but uh, Rapid Rabbit served with the 9th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing of the United States Air Force out of Kadena Air Base, 1972. Hopefully those of you who are stationed at Kadena don't uh, wince too badly if I mispronounce some of the Japanese terminology coming forward. So... What's the starting point of the SR-71? I feel like some of you that are watching this could probably give me an education on it. So uh, if I do happen to miss something that you feel should be shared or a correction or just want to add something to the conversation, please do so in the comment section below. I happen to love the fact that with social media now, people who worked on and built and tested and engineered and maintained these things now have an opportunity to put their voices out there for people to see. Um, biographers and writers don't necessarily have access to everyone, and therefore, sometimes a lot of important stories don't get the attention and due that they deserve until someone in a comment section of a video chimes in and relays their story and their aspect of what they did with this airplane when it was in service. So if you were one of those people that were involved with it or knew someone who were, uh, definitely uh, make your voices heard in the comment section. Um, it's definitely appreciated if by me, if I know one else. And I know others care about those stories too. And speaking of the story, the SR-71 story starts with a dilemma. So in the 1950s, the Cold War had just gotten started. The Soviet Union and the United States were now nuclear powers. And President Eisenhower realized that reconnaissance was going to be one of the most important strategic initiatives of the new Cold War because it's always important to keep an eye on what your adversary is doing. And we have to remember in the 1940s, late 40s, early 50s in the Cold War, there were no such thing as reconnaissance satellites in space. In fact, going into space at all was a fairly brand new idea. So if you wanted to take a picture of something back in that time, you had to do it with some kind of airplane. And so Eisenhower had commissioned the construction in cooperation with the Central Intelligence Agency and Lockheed Martin. Now, now at the time it was just called Lockheed, now it's Lockheed Martin. Um, the construction of the Utility 2 or U-2. And it was called the Utility 2 to make it seem uh, somewhat innocuous in the official papers of the time because the U-2 was in fact a high altitude spy plane. It had long, thin wings, which enabled it to fly at 80,000 feet, which made it essentially untouchable to the Soviet Union's interceptors of the time, which could at best muster about 50,000 feet. Uh, it was understood at the construction of the U-2 that while it would serve as a relatively effective uh, surveillance platform, 
there would come a time and a place where the U2 would be rendered obsolete. Uh, it was understood even in the 50s that the uh, technological developments in the Soviet Union would eventually make the U2 uh, ancient history. And sure enough, when Francis Gary Powers was shot down by a newfangled device called a surface-to-air missile, uh, it was clear to all parties that something different and something better had to be built. And so, in 1958, the A-12, codenamed Oxcar program, was started. So the A in A-12 comes from Archangel, and it was called that by Lockheed, who worked through a series of preliminary designs before they got to design number 11. The A-11 was presented as a candidate for the Oxcart program after uh, discussion and selection by the Central Intelligence Agency. The version 11 design was chosen as the winner against entrance from Conveyor and other contractors. The Lockheed Skunk Works A-11 had uh, been revised after some discussion within Lockheed to a version 12. And so the A-12 was built by the CIA's direction in the early 1960s. 12 aircraft, 12 A-12s were ordered by the CIA in 1960, with the first A-12 taking flight in 1962. The A-12 was the predecessor to the SR-71 that you see modeled before you, which is why we're talking about it in today's video. And I'm also talking about the A-12 because I think in the modern, wider discussion of aviation history, uh, folks may not have a clear picture of how the SR-71 and the A-12 played a part. Um, while the A-12 did precede the SR-71, there was a time when the SR-71 operated alongside the A-12. So let's rewind a little bit and talk about how the SR-71 uh, came to be in terms of how it got its name too. So the SR-71 originally started as kind of its own cousin of the A-12. After seeing the stupendous Mach 3.5 plus um, 75,000, 80,000 foot performance of the A-12, um, remember, we're talking about an airplane that's flying literally um, about 500 miles an hour faster than the muzzle velocity of a 30-06 rifle bullet. So, fairly amazing stuff, If in, even if someone built an airplane that did that today. Um, in the 1950s and early 60s, it was nothing short of extraordinary. And this extraordinary performance uh, prompted the Air Force to consider other uses for this highly capable platform. So as the CIA was operating the A-12 in classified surveillance operations, the U.S. Air Force drafted proposals for uh, three versions of the A-12 design for different missions. The first version would be a bomber version, actually initially called the B-70, uh, before the uh, XB-70 Valkyrie came to be, which prompted redesignation of the B-70 to B-71. Then there would be a F-12 interceptor, which would be used to meet and shoot down any Soviet bombers coming over the North American continent, kind of replacing the role of the F-102, F-101 Voodoo, and F-106 uh, Delta Dart. And then there would be a uh, RS-71 reconnaissance variant. Now as time progressed, uh, the research and development of these variants grew to be extraordinarily expensive. The uh, XB-71 was canceled before it ever got built. The F-12 was put into research and development, utilizing a huge developed long-range air-to-air uh, -air missile system. Now, those of you who are F-14 fans ought to perk up your ears at this info, because this is where the early, 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 earliest version of the AIM-54 Phoenix was basically developed. So the Hughes Aircraft Company developed a... Um, air-to-air -air radar and interception system, which tied to the long-range air-to-air missiles, would be used to enhance the lethality of the uh, F-12 interceptor. Now, the program got along in the research and development phase before Robert McNamara uh, basically looked at the price tag and decided, absolutely not, we can't afford this, and canceled it. So when it was canceled, that left the Hughes Aircraft Company with an amazing beginnings of a long-range weapon system, but no airplane to use it from. And that technical platform would make its way from the F-12 prototype to the F-111 naval variant, and then from the F-111 naval variant to, in its penultimate finalized form, 
the F14A Tomcat, of which I'm sure those of you that are watching this video know as much about it as I do. Um, so enough talk about Mavericks, right? We're gonna come back to the story of the SR71. So the, originally the RS71 proposal was for a uh, two seat a long range reconnaissance airplane, which would have um, somewhat more advanced and slightly different equipment than the single seat CIA operated A-12. And the plan was the RS-71 would fly in um, international airspace taking photos and reconnaissance data in a official capacity, meaning something that the government could acknowledge and say that was happening. And meanwhile, the CIA would continue operating the A-12 in a black operations, uh, discrete sort of deniable mode. So while the uh, SR-71 would be used to, again, conduct overflights in international airspace in areas and spaces where they're not crossing any borders. The A-12, on the other hand, would be used in, as befitting the Central Intelligence Agency, more discreet and deniable operations. So with that outlined, 32 of the SR-71s were eventually ordered and built, and the um, the RS to SR-71 situation is also worth mentioning because apparently in the documentation, it started off as the RS-71 and then by Curtis LeMay's direction, who happened to be the four-star chief of staff of the U.S. Air Force, the RS-71 designation was changed to SR-71, SR standing for Strategic Reconnaissance. Um, and there's also some discussion that uh, apparently you know, the, the president at the time might have made a speech and then mixed up RS to SR and then they didn't want to embarrass him. So they changed it. I'll just say right now, you don't change the name of an airplane because one politician looks bad on television. So um, official research in the matter pretty conclusively established that the RS to SR transition was very much an Air Force idea and initiated well before uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson gave the announcement of the SR-71. The SR-71 also served a dual purpose in that because it was a high speed, um, highly capable airplane of the time, in the event of a mishap or an accident with the then classified Oxcart A-12s, a cover story could be engineered that said that, you know, if an A-12 went down, for example, they could say that an SR-71 is what uh, crashed instead and that would, of course, cover the A-12's operation. So the A-12 and the SR-71 briefly operated together until the A-12's retirement before the 1970s. And while the A-12 had a brief but illustrious career in the Central Intelligence Agency, the SR-71 would continue to operate until the late 1980s, when citing uh, higher costs and the um, expense of operating these airplanes, they were briefly retired before they were brought back from retirement in the early to mid 90s before being finally retired before the turn of the 21st century in the uh, in 1999. So the SR-71 has quite the long history and again those of you that know more about it and worked with this airplane are certainly invited to put your uh, take and your history of it in the comment section below. So um, and it's an amazing piece of work. And as somebody who has seen this airplane in person at a couple of museums, one of which was the Strategic Air Command Museum in um, near Omaha. It's not quite in Omaha, but it's fairly near it. Um, it is an impressive piece of kit. So um, some of the fun facts about it. Um, it's actually painted dark blue, according to the publications. However, when I've seen this in person, and maybe it's just the wear and tear on it over time, um, it was pretty darn black. So um, make of that what you will, but um, dark blue, black, it, it looks darn intimidating in person. And it's giant. It's huge. We'll talk about that more when we get to the model impressions, but this is a large, large airplane. Um, to put things in perspective, when I went to the Strategic Air Command Museum, um, they have it set up where the SR-71 is basically the centerpiece of the entire atrium of the museum. So when you walk into the check-in desk at the front, um, you turn right, and you are basically looking right at the forward pitot boom of the airplane, and it takes up your entire visual view. Um, it's amazing. It's an amazing sight, and I will say right now that 
The SR-71 is so big that you could literally walk underneath it going into the museum in the first floor uh, display area of the Strategic Air Command Museum. And if you are taking I-80 at any point between east and west coast of the U.S. or on a road trip and uh, you're looking for things to do going through Omaha, I highly recommend that you stop by the Strategic Air Command Museum because they have some really cool airplanes. And I'm also glad to say that the probably the coolest airplane they have there isn't even the SR-71. It's the... Um, well, now, I should say, when I went there, they didn't have this, but now they've even got an F-117 on display. So it is um, it's a cool thing. But I was going to refer to the um, Constant Peg MiG-21 that they have there as well. So um, it's kind of tucked in the back underneath a couple of cargo airplanes, but it is, it's a good time. If you like airplanes, definitely check it out. So um, back to the airplane question, it is massive. It is huge, and it's black, and it looks mean which is why they call it them the Blackbird. Um, in the Japan, in the J Japanese operating area, they also gained the nickname of Habu, which as I understand it is Japanese for snake. So um, take your pick of which name you wanna call it, whether it's Blackbird or Habu, but either way, these things are freaking cool and they're fast. Uh, they go about Mach 3.2, which some of you out there might be watching this and thinking, what the heck's Mach 3.2? Well, I did the math for you. That's about 2,400 miles an hour. Now, if that's not an impressive number, just remember that that's um, significantly faster than a 30-06 rifle bullet when it leaves the muzzle. So if you took an SR-71 at uh, full speed and you had a hypothetical firing range at 76,000 odd feet and someone fired a 30-06 bullet at that altitude, um, the SR-71 would beat the bullet. It would win a drag race with a hunting rifle round. That, ladies and gentlemen, is fucking quick. Uh, so, just for the reference, a 30 out 6 rifle bullet at the muzzle goes about um, 1,400 miles an hour, which is about Mach 2.58. So, um, Mach 2.58 is pretty darn fast in and of itself, but you would lose a drag race to an SR-71 at full tilt speed. That's how fast this thing was. And the technology was built in the doo-wop era. Freaking amazing, right? So that speed meant that when the SR-71 was flying, or again, you're talking about an airplane that's moving so fast that it's outrunning a rifle bullet by about 500 knots. And put that in perspective, you know, 450, 500 knots, it's about the speed of an airliner at cruise altitude. So. If you think back to the last time you're flying somewhere, anywhere in the world, um, an SR-71 is that much faster than a full tilt rifle bullet. Like, really quick. And at that speed, uh, someone on the ground with a radar station or air defense system simply doesn't have the reaction time to track something moving that fast. Even if they see it on radar, and we'll get to some... Uh, reasons why they may not, at least at the time, even if they see this Blackbird hustling at, uh, you know, Mach 3.2 on their screen, by the time their eyes visually look at it and their brain processes that this airplane is on the screen and they need to coordinate some steps to intercept it or shoot at it, um, you know, it's already covered a massive amount of territory. And by the time someone at an air defense station picks up a phone or calls a boss and says, hey, do I have permission to shoot? Um, it's gone. It's it's already passed by that station and it's out of range. Even if you have a station where the SAM site is ready, the missiles are armed, the radar is locked in, and everyone is ready and waiting for an SR-71 to show up, by the time someone presses a locks on, presses a button and shoots, you gotta remember, a missile has to go from the ground at zero miles an hour to um, you know 2,400 miles an hour plus. Because remember, you can't intercept something at the same speed it's going. So whatever you launch at an SR-71 has to be faster than the SR-71 to catch it. And remember, this thing is an airliner speed faster than a rifle bullet at the muzzle. So um, you have to launch whatever weapon you're gonna shoot this thing down with at such a speed and direction and, and bearing that the interception weapon you launch is fast enough to catch this and do damage to the airplane when it gets there. And so, yeah, a SA-2 or SA-3 missile 
might have the ability to reach a target at the SR-71's altitude, but it is moving so freaking fast that by the time the missile gets to the altitude and is behind the airplane, it's going to run out of fuel and just you know self-destruct before it even catches up to the airplane. Um, so it's like you know it's like when you play Tetris, but you start off in the lower difficulty and the blocks come down slow and you can easily play the game and win. But when you're playing Tetris on like level 5,000, you know the blocks are coming down really, 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 really quick and you have to make whatever movements you need to before the block gets to the bottom and it, and it stops, right? And it's kind of that dynamic. Time is so compressed when engaging an SR-71 that even if your crews are ready to go, squared away, and their fingers are on the button, they know what they're shooting at, right? There's no, they're not trying to shoot down an airliner or something. Um, they know what they're locked onto. They know it's hot. They know it's an SR-71, and they know they want to engage it. Even if they do this, um, the odds of being able to intercept something moving at 2,400 miles an hour plus when in the space of time it takes me to say that, it's already come and gone off your radar scope, um, it's virtually zero. And, and so what? We'll go ahead and fire. By the time the missile accelerates from zero miles an hour on the ground to, um, you know, Mach, uh, you know, 3.3, well, that Blackbird's long gone. It's, it's out of there. It's history. And by that point, the missile's out of fuel and it's done. And of course, the SR-71 didn't fly naked. It had uh, electronic countermeasures built on. So even if your missile can get to that altitude and catch up to the airplane, it's very unlikely it's going to be able to guide accurately enough to hit it, which is why throughout the SR-71's operational history, uh, none were ever shot down. There were instances where SR-71s were intercepted. However, those circumstances usually involved some sort of mechanical problem with the airplane where something happened and the aircraft had to slow down. Maybe there was an engine problem or an electronics fault, in which case then the SR-71 would be unable to maintain that 2,400 plus mile an hour speed, therefore making it possible to intercept. And there's a particularly famous incident involving the brave actions of the Swedish Air Force in protecting an SR-71 during the Cold War from being intercepted by the Soviets when that SR-71 encountered mechanical problems during a mission over international airspace. So um, it's not to say that the SR-71 was perfect. You know, there were times where it had mechanical problems and it slowed down to have to deal with those issues. Um, and there could have been repercussions, fortunately, thanks to the intervention of the Swedish Air Force on one part. Uh, they protected the SR-71 and were decorated for it. Um, and that was actually re very recently declassified, something like in the last five years, the uh, event was made public and the Swedish officers involved, who have of course retired since then, were recognized in a public ceremony for their uh, bravery in intercepting and protecting the SR-71 as it um, basically limped home. And when I say limped home, I mean it flew at the speed of a normal airplane, which is a very interesting thing to say, right? So. Because of the speed of this airplane, it's moving at, you know, again, 500 knots faster than a rifle bullet. So that's a lot of friction and the air friction encountering the skin of the airplane meant that the Skunk Works designers at Lockheed had to countermeasure that. So what they did is they built the airplane with very large gaps uh, relative to other airplanes. So on the ground, it is, you know, there, there's gaps in the airplane. There's actually fuel leaking out of the tanks because the gaps are that big. And it's only when the airplane goes close to Mach 1 that those wide gaps in the titanium plating seal up. And once the expansion of these panels fills in the gaps, then the airplane is completely sealed. The fuel doesn't leak anymore. And the airplane is able to... Um, you know, book it at 2,400 something miles an hour. So you can see this is actually modeled really well on this. Uh, Sentry wings captured the panel gaps and the, and the plates of it uh, in the model. And some of the trapezoidal uh, arrangement of the parts was also done to take into account the fact that at that high speed, you're looking at 600 degrees of uh, skin temperature. So if you think about your average oven, baking at 450 degrees this was you know 30 percent hotter than that when this airplane's flying so it's very hot 
and they had to allow for that in the design of the skin and the frame of the airplane. The cockpit windows, which you see here modeled on the aircraft, were not actually glass. These were built out of uh, fused quartz, and once again, that was done to account for the substantial 600 degree temperature of the airplane at the uh, cruising speed and altitude that these things went on. And the tires, one of, set of which you see right here, are built in uh, a way that they have nitrogen, they don't have air in them, they have nitrogen, and they cost $2,300 each because they had to be extraordinarily temperature resistant while still being capable of uh, cushioning the airplane on landing. And the tires are only good for 20 landings. So if you happen to score one of the, the real ones on Craigslist sometime, just bear in mind you're gonna be changing a lot of tires if you fly that thing. So the other benefit, or I should say difference, of the SR-71 versus the A-12, if you ever wanna know which one is which, are the fuselage shines. They're a bit wider on the SR-71 than they are on the A-12, which also, unless you're talking about a specialized variant for training, will only have one seat, whereas the SR-71 has two. Uh, the chines are an aspect that helps initially with radar uh, diffusion and absorption, which is somewhat of the first practical application of what would later be called stealth and was one of Lockheed's first efforts in something that we now take as a household name. Now remember, they built these things in the early 1960s, hence the uh, 61-7978 serial. You know, this was built before uh, the Bee Gees ever hit the radio. This was built before, um, you know, Martin Luther King's assassination. This was built before we landed on the moon. I mean, this is, it's crazy. It's crazy, 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 crazy stuff. So, um, you know, and this is the first generation of stealth technology. I mean, folks were building that in the F-35 now, and people think, well, this is cutting edge, brand new stuff. And in reality, you know, the first iteration of it was when Lockheed built the SR-71 uh, before the Beatles hit the airwaves. You know, that's, that's crazy, 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 crazy stuff. And we're not even done because then there's the engine, right? And I have to talk about the engine and how that worked because it does play a important part in the model and some of the accuracy representations of it. So the engines are certainly something worth independent study. And if you are someone that likes that kind of thing, I highly recommend that you look up some resources on the SR-71 and the J-58 engine because it is a marvel of engineering. Um, essentially, what you have is a configuration. And remember, this was built in the 19, uh, like late 50s, early 60s. This, you know, the A-12 first flew in 1962. Crazy, okay? This is the first iteration of something fairly close to, but not quite a scramjet. Uh, essentially what happens is, uh, and I'm going to very simplify this because I could probably take up an hour just talking about the dang engines. And there are videos actually of just people talking about the engines because of just how much of an engineering feat they are. But in summary, with how they're represented in the model, you have um, an intake pathway, which goes from here. Now you have the shot cone, which moves in and out. You have an intake, which of course takes the air in, vent doors here and here, and then vent doors here. There's also another set which isn't modeled. We'll talk to that in some of the model details later in the video. And then you have your afterburner back here. Now, in normal jet engine operation, what you have is the um, what one engineer called the squeeze suck bang, bang blow process, right? You, the air comes in, it's squeezed through some compressor blades, um, it's you know, combusted, this is the bang part, it's combusted in the combustion chamber, which is obviously not visible here, but inside the engine, and then it comes out the back, and then if you have an afterburner, um, you put more fuel in it, and then that's lit, and there's your blow, right? A squeeze suck, bang, blow. Now, with the J58, they did something, something kind of interesting here. They took and made a computer, remember 1960s era computer, it's relatively primitive by modern standards, but for the time, extraordinarily uh, cutting edge technology, which would track the position of this uh, shot cone. And what the shot cone does is it moves in and it moves out. Now it's not modeled, it's fixed on the model, but this goes out when the airplane is going slow and it moves inward when the airplane goes fast. Because what happens is at slow speeds, the nozzle, or I should say the shot cone is extended, the airflow is slowed, the air goes in, and the vent doors on the side are open to bring more air in because what happens is 
um, the air coming in and the air coming in here, uh, or I should say the air coming in here and the air, some of the air going out goes into the compressor section. It's, you know, squeeze, uh, bang, you know, squeeze, suck, bang, blow, and it goes out the back and it works something like your average ordinary jet engine. But when the airplane goes close to Mach 1, something interesting happens. The shot cone here is uh, retracted. The airflow is sped up. The um, vent doors here are opened, or I should say they're, they're actually uh, closed. Vent door here are opened a little bit more because now some of the air needs to be let out and you have a combination system. The air coming in, some of it is combusted. You know, you have your squeeze, suck, bang, blow process. It's burned in the engine, comes out. Some of the air is bypassing the combustion section and just goes straight to the afterburner. And then it either bypasses the engine or it is uh, burned in the afterburner section here and then comes out the back. And when it goes really fast, like 2,400, you know, 400 miles an hour, um, you know, screw your rifle bullet is a slow poke speed. Then the shot cone is moved completely inside, not completely, but it's moved uh, much closer inside the engine. The doors here are closed, doors here are closed, uh, doors here are closed. Most, pretty much all of the air, uh, I'm sure some of it's directed into the engine, but all of it, I say all of it, most of it is directed outside of the combustion chamber of the engine. It just bypasses the squeeze up bang, bang blow section here, bypasses that, goes right into the afterburner, and it's burnt. And it's the airplane's moving so fast that, you know, it's leaving a rifle bullet in the dust, which means the air doesn't need to be compressed anymore to uh, to be ignited. It's just it's squeezed inside the intake, and that's all the pressure that that high speed six, you know, we're talking 600 degrees on the skin, so it's going very fast. The air is moving quickly, and it's moving quickly enough that you don't need to go through a special process to ignite it. It just goes into the afterburner, and it's lit. And when it goes that fast, um, it, it's very fuel efficient because the air just basically has to be put in the right place and burned up. And it is a marvel of engineering. And I realize I've oversimplified a lot of this, and I kind of have to because, again, I could just sit here and talk about the engine for probably uh, you know a two hour long video and I still might miss stuff. That's how amazing the J58 is. So we're gonna come back to this. And again, I'm going into some of this detail in the motor for a reason. Uh, I'm not forgotten that this is a model review too. So it's gonna be something we will circle back to when we get to the model details. But in order to talk to that, you gotta know how this thing works in the first place. And besides, it is just freaking cool, isn't it? So, when we look at um, the aircraft in question, we see that this is uh, serial number 617978. Uh, again, this one was posted to the U.S. Air Force Air Base at Kadena, Japan in the early uh, mid-60s to the 1970s. And this one was named Rapid Rabbit because of the Playboy insignia that you see back here. Um, the Playboy insignia on certain military airplanes was kind of a, a meme of its own thing. You just have to remember in the 1960s, having your own private jet was pretty darn cutting edge. And Hugh Hefner had one of the biggest. He had a DC-9, completely painted black. You can actually look at my video on the uh, Sentry Wings F-14 with the Playboy logo if you want to get some historical footage of what his airplane looked like back in the day. But it was black and it was big. And of course... Hugh Hefner symbolized the quintessential bachelor, right? The ultimate man's man with all the women in the Playboy Mansion and the, you know, the robe and the high tech, you know, party scene and everything of that sort. So um, having a black military airplane, which was not a common thing, um, it just lent itself to having the Playboy logo applied. And of course, the U.S. Navy had the, um, you know, the black bunny uh, VX uh VX4, which later became VX9, um, Black Bunny, um, you know, F4 Phantoms, and then those, of course, changed to the F14. And now, in 2023, they've brought back the Vandy One scheme, although they didn't bring back the uh, Playboy logo for obvious political correctness reasons. Um, and, you know, times have changed and proprieties and sensibilities have changed as well, so it's probably for the best they didn't bring it back. But... You have the uh, Vandy One color scheme on a Super Hornet now, which is absolutely beautiful. And I do plan to pick one of those up when Hobby Master releases that model later this year. But coming back to the 
Playboy logo on this model. Um, this was relatively unique for an Air Force airplane and certainly for the Blackbird. Again, it was only one of four that ever got a unique name. Unfortunately, this particular serial was lost in a runway accident in July 20th, 1972 during extreme crosswinds while landing at Cadena Air Base. Unfortunately, some of the problems with flying a relatively secret reconnaissance platform like this during the Cold War is if you have a uh, weather situation at your recovery airbase, you can't divert. If you're flying on an airliner, Cessna, F-15, um, you know, F-35, some other kind of normally understood airplane, if you find out in flight that your original airbase that you intend to land at is closed due to weather or high crosswinds or some sort of issue, you can just divert to another airbase that you've already selected and um, work your logistics that way, right? And that's just a normal aspect of aviation. But with the SR-71 and in any majorly classified piece of technology like that back in the day, you can't just land this thing at Joe Blow's private airport if your original U.S. Air Force launch recovery air base is uh, weathered out. And so at that day, uh, they were trying to land this airplane at Cadena when high crosswinds resulted in the drag chute failing. Now a drag chute is a parachute which comes out the back of the airplane right about there and helps with the brakes and slowing this airplane down. If you think pressing the brakes on your uh, grandparents' old Cadillac was a dodgy proposition, just remember the brakes on this airplane are only slightly bigger than those you find on a 70-foot semi-trailer, and it has to stop a multi-thousand-pound titanium sled of an airplane that is literally built by aerodynamics to be as slippery through the air as possible. And that meant landing the SR-71 was kind of tricky, even in the best of days. You needed a long runway, and you needed the drag chute. Otherwise, the brakes would overheat, and the airplane would not be able to be stopped on the runway in time. Well, when they landed, the crosswind situation resulted in the crew losing the aft uh, drag chute, which meant they had to do a go around. And when they came around to land again, the brakes on the airplane were not sufficient to stop it in time, which resulted in the Blackbird overrunning the end of the runway and going into the ditch at the end of it. Fortunately, the pilot and the reconnaissance systems officer were able to get out of the airplane and were not injured, which is, of course, the most important part but the airplane was a write-off, unfortunately, from the incident. So apparently, it is buried at Kadena in a hill called Habu Hill, after, of course, the Japanese nickname of the airplane. And it was buried probably because you can't scrap something that's made out of titanium. It's a very difficult material to work with. The entire airplane is built out of it because, remember, 600 degree temperature at high speed and all. And, um, trying to scrap the materials of this airplane, especially at that time in the 1970s, it would have been an excellent opportunity for a security leak, right? You don't want some piece of scrap titanium making its way back to a conference room in Mother Russia, now do we? So that's the unfortunate end of the airplane, but uh, it really goes to show you just how amazing this airplane is that, uh, you know, it, it had a career going into the late 1990s, which is utterly amazing. And I have to say that, you know, at this point, the SR-71 still retains the record for being the fastest um, air-breathing manned military airplane ever built. But I suspect that the Air Force and Lockheed have probably built something significantly faster. Um, I don't think it was ever, uh, it's not been publicly acknowledged. And I think the Top Gun Maverick movie is probably as close as we'll ever get in recent years to an acknowledgement of something like that. But uh, Lockheed, it's almost safe to say that ever since this was retired in 1999, I find it extraordinarily difficult to believe that the creative people, the men and women at the Lockheed Skunk Works, have not built something that is faster, that is as fast to the, this SR-71 as the SR-71 is to that proverbial rifle bullet. And I'm really excited to see what they've come up with in the coming years. Hopefully that whatever that faster airplane is um, will be declassified before we're all old and gray and decrepit and we can enjoy some uh, discussion and hopefully some really cool 170 second scale models of whatever replaced this because uh, that would be you know considering what they they built this before like you know the 50 the 57 chevy was basically a, a relatively new model of a of car when this was built 
you know, that's how far back that goes. And we're talking a, a 2,000, you know, 400 mile an hour airplane built when the flathead, a 57 Chevy small block was cutting edge automotive technology on the drag strip. I wonder what they've come up with since. So with that, we'll shift to the model impressions. Uh, the first thing to talk about is, I mentioned it a little earlier, but it is huge. It's massive. It's big. Um, and it's realistic. I have to say that having seen this airplane in person, uh, once again at the Strategic Air Command Museum and uh, the uh, Cosmodrome in Kansas, th th this thing is massive. It's huge. Uh, basically, every museum that has one has to build their building around it because of how huge it is. Um, the model is 18 inches by 9.5, so from nose of the pedo to the back of the tail, you're looking at about 18 inches. And from the edge of the delta wing to the other edge of the delta wing, you're looking at nine and a half inches in width. And it is 2.25 inches in height from the top of the rudder to the bottom of the relatively flat uh, fuselage of the airplane. To put that in perspective, a 172nd scale F-16 model will fit lengthwise from here to here with a little bit of room to spare on the pedo tube. It's big. It's a big freaking model. So those of you who display your airplanes in flight, just be aware you may have to do some finagling because this is a massive airplane. It's bigger than my F-111 models. It's easily the biggest, um, one of the biggest 172nd scale models I have. It's not my largest. I have a KC-135 and a B-1B that I built, both from plastic kits, one being the AMT KC-135, and the B-1 is from a, a monogram kit, which I will put on the channel one of these days when I get confidence enough to do it, because it's one of my first builds, and there are some flaws that I'd like to correct before I show it to you all, but those are bigger, but not by much. Uh, this is a large, large model, and you should be prepared for that if you want to order this and display it in your collection. So it comes with one pilot and one reconnaissance system officer. The pilot sits in the front and the reconnaissance system officer sits in the back. The figures don't have legs because they kind of have to not have them in order to fit in the cockpit. And they do sit somewhat loose for my taste. So I would recommend that you get some double-sided tape or some blue tack before you put them in because otherwise they're gonna rattle around in there when you put the model on a stand. Um, and if you put it on a stand and it's tilted to the side or you, you do some display like that, the figures are going to come out of the seats unless you do some um, work with a um, with some blue tack on the bottom or, again, double-sided Gorilla Tape on the bottom. Uh, so just bear that in mind. But the figures themselves, besides that detail, are really well done. They're painted gold to reflect the pressure suits, which the U.S. Air Force pilots did wear during these missions and uh, the helmets are also realistic because the pressure suits are designed to maintain atmospheric uh, health of the, of the uh, wearer. So in the event of a depressurization problem at 75, 80,000 feet, the uh, U.S. Air Force pilots won't have any health complications if that unfortunate event happens. So the pressure suits are quite a bit different than your standard pilot suits, which are worn on flights below 50,000 feet for U.S. crews. So uh, they've done a good job modeling it. I'm glad to see that the uh, golden uh, tint and uh, the golden paint of the uh, figures is done really well, as well as the shape of the helmet. So Hobby Master could learn a thing or two from how uh, Century Wings did their figures there. So the paint setup with the U.S. Air Force insignia the Skunk Work logo here, or excuse me, the uh, Reconnaissance logos there. I kind of thought of the Skunk Works logo seeing those. So the Reconnaissance mission marks here are all really well done. The uh, Rescue Warning Access Port and um, Service Notification Areas on the side of the fuselage are done really well, both on this side and the next. You have U.S. Air Force on the side of the paint with the old stars and bars there. And you have your no-step demarcation lines, which are indications for the service and maintainers to know where to walk and when not to in order to avoid damaging the airplane or, heaven forbid, themselves. The uh, little port right here is for the uh, Astro Inertial Navigation System, or uh, ANS for short, because this was built again in the 1960s 
GPS, global positioning system, was not a thing back then. So to make sure the airplane was accurately going where it's supposed to go and didn't cross any international borders and cause any geopolitical problems, it needed a very accurate navigation system. And to that end, the Astro Inertial Navigation System, or ANS, was built as a pre-GPS onboard uh, navigation setup. And what it did is the system would look through this viewport, com configure the location of the airplane relative to the stars, and it would calculate the aircraft's position to, I believe, within 500 feet, which is, you know, today in the world of GPS, it doesn't sound very impressive. But remember, we're talking about technology built in the 60s to the 1970s. Fairly amazing technology for its time, and it was completely self-contained. So it did not require a radio signal or an uplink to a satellite. It was completely self-contained navigation, and of course, the fella in the back right here would control it. Um, as far as I understand, there were no uh, women that served as reconnaissance systems officers, so uh, unfortunately I'm forced to use the male pronoun there, but that the individual back here would operate the system and would make sure that the airplane was where it was supposed to be, which when you are conducting reconnaissance missions over international airspace near countries that don't necessarily like you, that's a very important job. And they've modeled that viewport fairly accurately. On the bottom, which you can't see, but it is included on the model down here, there are the reconnaissance uh, access cameras and viewpoints down there with appropriate labels. And you have the serial number prefix here, or suffix here, and the serial number painted up here in accordance with the US Air Force regulations and the storied Playboy insignia there. So again, paint is done really well here. Um, which brings us to the next point, which is the engines. Earlier in the video, I talked about the configuration and how the behavior of the nozzle work relative to the airspeed of the SR-71 and its various regimes. And we're gonna circle back to that now because as displayed, this model is rendering a incomplete slash inaccurate engine configuration because we have the aft ports open the louvers here are, it looks like they're closed. Correct me in the comments if uh, someone at Century Wings uh, knows or intends different, but this looks to be in the closed position and the, uh, the intake uh, spike is in the intermediate, I would say intermediate position, meaning it's not quite fully forward, not quite fully back. And this configuration is not in alignment with how an SR-71 would look either at high speed or at medium or low speed. So um, that whether that's a drawback or not is going to depend on your level of uh, precision, how precise you want the model to be. For some people, it is a deal breaker on the front door of things. That's it. They're, they're done. Close the door, lock the deadbolt. They're, they're out. For some, it's something that's not a big deal. It just depends on you as the collector and whether that's something you really value. Um, it would have been nice if... Sentry wings either included the option of changing out the uh, intake spike, you know, kind of like what Caliber and Hobby Master do. They put parts on there that you can take off or put in to simulate certain aspects of the aircraft model and certain regimes. You know, if you have the afterburner open or closed or targeting pod included or not included, uh, it would have been nice to have some kind of way to change the intake spike so you can model it with the intake fully forward in the airplane at like Mach 3.2 on your desk, which would be really nice. Um, and in order, of course, to do that, the uh, aft louvers would have to be closed. So, um, you know, I, I think I'm not ignorant to the fact that it probably would be some engineering challenges to do that accurately, and it would probably increase the model's cost. But, you know, this is our 71 we're talking about here. So it would have been nice to have a setup where you know, you could display it with the vents, these vents open, this forward or this back, and this closed or this open. You know, it'd be nice to have some options there. And I realize budgets and production limitations, of course, always apply. Uh, you know, Century Wings has to mass produce these things, and that imposes a limit on the amount of customization that they can do. So, I would have been open to see, you know, if they had to model it, like maybe model it at Mach 1.5. So, you have the intake spike in intermediate position, the vent doors in the open position, these closed. Um, you know, it'd be 
it, it, I don't know. It, it just, I realize this is a problem that may not have a practical solution because no matter how they build it, somebody like me is going to make a video and go, hey, you know, if I, if they did make it at like Mach 1.5, somebody might come in and say, well, it should have been made to go at Mach 3.2, which if you, you know, make the model look like that and you don't make any parts that can change it, then you can't display it on the ground because there's no condition on the ground where you would have it parked and the intake spike would be fully forward and you know when everything's closed and it's going Mach 3.2 I mean that's not compatible with how it would be on the ground realistically but again what we're seeing here where you have the vent doors in the closed position this open and this intermediate that's also not a real position the engines would ever be in anyway so that is I don't know I feel like there might not be a solution to that let, let me know what y'all think what would you do to solve this uh, I put my idea forward if you were you know if you were the HUD honcho at Century Wings and it was your task to figure out a way to solve this the display in a way that would be accurate and also uh, not drive the price up too much because these things are already going for about 160 US dollars so uh, what would your all thoughts be I'm curious I'd like to hear your your take on that so um, further, the intake spikes here are also somewhat rotated. They're like pronated out. They should be like they should be in line with the axis of the engine. And if you look at it from the top down, they're not. The intake spikes, instead of being in line with the engine, are somewhat like kinked or a little, little kinked forward, a little kinked inward. Um, again, it's not to an extent that would immediately ruin the presentation of this model on a desk, but it is something you should know about because these things do cost quite a bit of money. So yeah, it, it's a flaw. It is something to note, but to me, it doesn't really take away too much from the presentation of it, seeing as how uh, Century Wings did do a good job with the rest of it. And I also should point out too, that there is a gap here which is not quite as visible on this side but it is somewhat noticeable here which is an assembly line or seam line and the paint comes over it in a way that does make it a bit noticeable if you're looking at it up close um, so in terms of drawbacks um, there you have it uh, but in good news before i completely knock the engine configuration of this i do have to say that century wings did a great job painting the afterburner uh, interior you can't see it from this angle but you'll hopefully be able to catch it in some of the intro footage how you can see the inside of the nozzles are painted a really appropriate silver um, titanium sort of finish so i do like the fact that they did that because century wings didn't have to do that they could have just left it completely black and done some generic detailing and it probably would have been okay but they did go the extra mile to make sure that the back of the intakes or the engine exhaust for the j58s are painted silver and look reflective of that and uh, i do i do like that in some of the aft shots so i just wish there was a way for them to engineer it so that the engine um you know vent louvers could be changed out so you can display it at mach 3.2 or mach 1.5 or a subsonic or on the ground and considering that again this thing moves 500 knots faster than a rifle bullet that's kind of key i would like to do that and i may just as a personal project for a later day and time and potentially later video i may just um take some filler and close this up and then paint it black so it looks like it's in a more uh, realistic in-flight configuration uh, we'll see we'll see that might be something i might do later to it but um, there you have it for the overall impressions of it. And I think all things considered, it is a quality representation of it. Uh, it is at this point, far as I know, in 2023, probably the best die cast option that you can get that's ready to display out of the box. I believe there's an Air Force One version out there, which is somewhat less expensive, but substantially less detailed. And the options get worse from there. And speaking of options, I would recommend that you get a router style, a three prong stand like I showed in the intro shot. It does come with a stand, but it fixes the SR71 at a nose up climb angle presentation. And personally, I think this, you know, this is such a photogenically beautiful airplane. You really should have the option to display it any way you want. And it is heavy. It's a relatively heavy model. So, 
you know, for having flexibility to pose it however you want to, especially with the size and, and weight of it. I think having the um, the kind of three-legged uh, router style stand gives you some more options with presenting it than the original fixed stand, which worked. It's a good stand that comes in the box. But again, a router style stand would give you some more options. And when you're dealing with a model that's, you know, nine and a half inches wide, Okay, we're talking about a model that's wider than the F-16 models are long. Um, you know, you're looking at a fairly sizable piece of kit. So having flexibility to display it however you want to is kind of key. And that's why, again, I recommend that if you um, don't have one already to take a, a three prong router style stand and get it with it. Because when you're dealing, again, 18 inches long, Flexibility is important. So I'll also point out that you can display it in flight or on the ground. Obviously on the ground, you do get the full set of landing gear as modeled here. You have the nose gear and the aft main gear. Um, I did see an earlier video someone did of one that didn't come with a nose gear, um, but I did obviously get one in mind. So hopefully those of you that have gotten these from Century Wings, some of their earlier releases, can comment on whether that's just a one-time deal that happened to that YouTuber or if that's something that we all have to look out for and I just got lucky. But um, all things considered, to conclude, I think if you're a fan of the SR-71 or the A-12, get it. Get this and call it done. Get one of these uh, Century Wings models. They're only going to go up in price. So they, I think they do like 500 or 800 of them, and then that's it. They don't make any more of that particular color scheme. And then Century Wings does not publish their release schedule that far in advance. So at this point, at the time of this video, you can still get these on eBay for about 160 bucks. Uh, if you are a fan of the SR-71 and don't have one of these, or if you have a collection that's not really oriented to the Blackbird, um, consider stepping out of your comfort zone and picking up one of these. Um, since I do review models that I own, you're very rarely going to get a review from me that says don't buy it because if you're looking at it, I already paid my money for it. And if I paid my money for it, hopefully I've chosen something that I like. So I don't have a retail store or some association with the manufacturers where they're sponsoring my content. Everything you see here is produced and solely at my discretion with my perspective. So uh, again, I don't have a store where I get access to inventory or th models and things that I may not necessarily purchase. So um, you're very rarely going to see me recommend that you don't buy something. So um, if you've gotten that trend when watching my videos, that's why. And with this one, I would say get it. Uh, obviously, I paid my own money for it. I'm glad to have it in the collection. And if you are a fan of the SR-71 story, um, get it. If you're not, Hey, step out of your comfort zone. Try something different. Uh, do something new. And you all will hopefully, if everything goes to plan, be watching this on the morning of July 4th. So happy 4th of July for those of you American viewers and those of you watching of American Association and Persuasion overseas. And hopefully we will catch you in the next installments on my channel. Thank you all again for watching. And if you haven't subscribed, Please consider subscribing, that way you will be notified of upcoming videos that I post on the channel, and you'll be able, of course, to uh, get priority participation if and when the time comes that I host a live stream and a chat. So uh, again, consider subscribing, that will also tell me that I'm doing a good job, and um, leave your questions, feedback, and input in the appropriate places below, and we'll catch you in the next video.